Okay, hello. Uh, now we're going to learn about extending scikit-learn with your own regressor from Florian Wilhelm. Thank you. <laughs> hello, everybody. So in my talk, I'll, um, in my talk, extending scikit-learn with your own regressor, I'll first give a short introduction to scikit-learn is, maybe most of you know. And then I'll talk about an estimator which is not included, which is not yet included in, in scikit-learn, a robust estimator called Tilesen. Um, with this as, as an example, I'll show you how you can implement your own estimator in scikit-learn, how to extend scikit-learn. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, what you need to consider if you want to contribute an own uh, estimator to scikit-learn. And I'll tell a little bit about my own experiences in contributing to scikit-learn. So first of all, what is scikit-learn? So scikit-learn is a machine learning library, so whenever you have some kind of uh, data and you want to extract some insight from this data, you can scikit-learn. Uh, you can use scikit-learn. Um, it's a simple, efficient tool for data mining and data analytics, so it's really simple to use. And um, so that makes it accessible for everyone, and you can really apply it to all kinds of problems. So I, took this uh, marketing sentences right from the web page, but it's really true, so it's really extremely simple. So if you haven't used it, you should, uh, you should definitely look into scikit-learn. It's built on NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib, so two, three famous uh, libraries which are used all over in the Python ecosystem. And uh, what is really good, it's open source, but still commercially usable, so it's BSD licensed, so if you want to um, not, maybe not contribute everything you do with it back to scikit-learn, you can still use it, which makes it really good in the commercial applications. Okay, so this picture, um, it can also be found on the scikit-learn website. I like it because it gives a nice overview of uh, the things you can do with scikit-learn the basic areas of applications. So you can do classifications. So a typical example would be if you have like handwritten digits and you want to classify if a digit is a one or a seven, for instance. <laughs> then you have um, everything related to clustering. If you're just looking for um, patterns in the data without having some kind of labels, uh, real, real um, targets. So for unsupervised learning, you can use clustering. Um, it also supports dimensional reduction techniques, so when you have too many features and you want to avoid overfitting, uh, for instance, you have a lot of tools to do PCA and so on, so dimensional reduction, and of course, the whole regression part, if you want to find the relationship to a target variable, uh, depending on some features, and this is what we're going to talk about. So. But before we start, first um, a little um, refreshing from the, maybe from school, if you've learned about this, the least square. The least square method um, is called linear regression uh, in uh, scikit-learn. And I want to shortly explain how it works because Tilesen um, is a kind of extension to this regressor. So we have uh, independent variables, x1 to xp, and in scikit-learn speak, they're called features. And we have a dependent variable, so the so-called target y. And now we want to build a model, we want to use the features to somehow predict the value of y. And a typical, really simple approach is just a linear model. So you have a linear combination of x and the coefficient um, w and um, you try to explain your target variable y with the features x. So in order to now find the, the w's, um, you minimize a functional, which is given here. So this is then the least square, you're uh, minimizing the, the square distances, and uh, in a typical one-dimensional case, this um, is a picture here, so the, the blue dots is your data, and um, in one dimension, so the x-axis uh, is, uh, is a feature, and uh, the red um, line now minimizes uh, the square distances to all black dots. So this works really well if you have, uh, if you have perfect data, because um, there's an internal assumption that uh, error value is normally distributed, so this works then quite well. But 
in practice and in many, many, in many projects um, that I worked on, all the data you get maybe from customers is less than perfect. So you have a lot of um, outliers, you have corrupted data because of measurement, measurement errors, because of um, maybe someone put in a wrong value somewhere. And then quite often your data looks like this in one dimension. So you directly see on the, on the right half side that there are some values that don't really fit to the really dense line on the left side. So what you would do in this case, you would maybe just remove those dots just by, by, by looking at this plot and decide, okay, I don't want to take this into my, um, into my fit. But what do you do if you are in a, in a 10 dimensional space or in an n-dimensional space? Then you can't just see by, by looking at the plot like this, which are your outliers. And you need to somehow make some complicated pre-processing to eliminate those outliers. So what happens if you now just apply um, the ordinary least square? So you would get, of course, a complete wrong results. So you would not expect the line to go like this. You would rather want to have um, the line to go through the, the, the black line, to the dense line on the left side. So this is something I think what is really, you really need to consider whenever you look at new data that there are no outliers in this new data and that you come up with something robust. So the tile sen as a natural um, generalization of, uh, of the least square method is an algorithm that now looks at all possible pairs of those, uh, of your sample points and calculates a list of slopes. And then, in this case, and, uh, if you have, in the end, the list of slopes, you take the median. And the median is what, it makes, what, 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 the, uh, what makes the method really robust, because the median doesn't care about a single value, it only cares about the ranks, so the order of those values. So I think this is easily shown and understood with an example. So here again, um, our plot with the, with the outliers. We now take two points, the two red dots here. We calculate the slope connecting those two plots and add it to the list um, just close to the x-axis um, and the slope is 3.1 in this case. And now we just go on with all possible points and uh, so this time it's uh, 3.1 again. And uh, now we are not so lucky anymore so we have one outlier connecting with one point we would consider not to be an outlier and so the slope is 3.1, and you see the, the list is sorted. And uh, we go on, another one, and um, bad luck, so even two outliers. And we could go on and on and on, but already here we see that um, if we look at the center of the list of slopes, that um, the median, so this, the, the center, is um, correct. So it's uh, 3.0, and if we look at 3.0, so this is... Um, the, the slope of the line we would expect, yeah, how the line should be, so inside this dense line of our sample points. So the whole principle is this, that you take the median and that, that you don't look at um, all points. So in this method, the outliers, they're not really considered anymore in this case. So this is um, the case for a two-dimensional problem, so just one feature and a target uh, variable. Of course, this method can be extended to, um, to n-dimensional space, because in most cases, if you use scikit-learn, you will have a lot of features and not only one feature. And um, in an n-dimensional space, so I've given here um, the citation to this uh, paper, um, in an n-dimensional space, you don't have any slopes anymore, so the slopes become hyperplanes, and the list of slopes then becomes a list of vectors. And um, so, but you basically do the same thing. You sample in an n-dimensional space n plus one points, make a an hyperplane, and put this vector of the hyperplane inside the list. And then um, it becomes a little bit tricky because um, then you need to decide what is the median of a list of slopes. And the median um, of a list of slopes 
can then be, for instance, the spatial median. And the spatial median is just, if you see the list of uh, vectors as just points in an n-dimensional space, you try to find the one point so that the sum over all distances to all other points is uh, minimized. So this is uh, the so-called so Fermat-Weber problem. But basically, it works exactly like, like it does here. OK, then again, um, the comparison, the ordinary least square and the tile sen, if you do this iteration really for all points, uh, it finds the perfect line. So, OK, so um, this is uh, about the motivation of tile sen. And um, at one project, I had to deal with corrupted data and outliers I could not really uh, by hand remo uh, remove by hand. And um, then I tried, OK, how would I now implement this um, estimator inside of uh, scikit-learn? So the good thing about scikit-learn is that you have a lot of good documentation. So I think um, the, the scikit-learn is used so often because the documentation is just so well. So if you look for uh, how to write an own uh, regressor, you directly get a manual, and uh, you need to, if you want to write an own regressor, you have to provide two fu uh, four functions, set params and get param params. This is, of course, for setting and getting the parameters of your estimator. And those methods are um, they more or less used only internally. So um, they're used, for instance, if you do cross-validation or if you use another kind of meta estimator, those um, functions are used to set and get the parameters of your estimator. But you need to implement them for, um, yeah, for, uh, for your own estimator. And of course, you need a fit and a predict method. So the base estimator class, which is inside of scikit-learn, already gives you an implementation of set params and get params so that you can just inherit from it. And um, since, we are, since TileSend is a linear model, we can also directly uh, inherit linear model. And this also gives you the predict method, because in a linear case, as we've seen before with the formulas, um, predicting um, a feature or design matrix X is just a, a matrix uh, vector product. So you just take X times the weights W we have calculated before. So if we inherit, like shown on the right side, if we just take, uh, in, let our tile sen estimator inherit from linear model, we already get set params, get params, and predict. And additionally, we have uh, so-called mix-ins in scikit-learn. So the principle of mix-ins is that you have some reusable code that can only work together inside something larger. And um, you can combine different mix-ins inside a class. And in Python, mix-ins are uh, done with the help of multiple, in multiple inheritance. And in our case, so there are a lot of mix-ins, classifiers, regressors, cluster, transformer mix-ins. In our case, since we are writing a regressor, we, of course, inherit also the regressor mix-in, which gives us additional, additional functionality, like, for instance, a score function. So, but that's already about it. So um, to see the source code, so um, tile sen, as I said before, we just inherit from linear model and regressor mix-in to get set params, get params, and predict. Um, we override, override the init function. I made an abbreviation here. So um, of course, you state all different kinds of parameters you have in your init function, like if you want to fit the intercept or if you don't want to fit the intercept. Um, in my case, yeah, there, there are like 10 different um, parameters. Also, if you want to work maybe only on a subset of your sample points and so on. And if you want to make this subsampling with the help of some random state and so on. So the in more interesting part is then the, um, the fit function. Um, X is now the design matrix, the feature matrix, and Y the target, as usual in um, scikit-learn. Here I um, check with the help of check random state. The random state, if we really do some, some, some subsamplings, um, if we work on some sub population of X, if, if you don't want to consider all combinations. And um, we also check the arrays X and Y. So check arrays and check random states are two functions which are in scikit-learn utils. And if you write your own function, uh, if, you, if you write your own estimators, 
um, you should have a look in, uh, in scikit-learn utils for all the developer tools which help you a lot doing those repetitive uh, things like, yeah, checking array, is it a float, is it a dense format, and is the random state given as a number that you should use as seed, or is it a random state object itself and should just be passed on. So this is about the, the developer tools inside scikit-learn. Then the actual algorithm comes. I don't want to go into too much detail about this algorithm. So as I said before, it's basically uh, quite simple. It's just uh, technical because you need to create all those different combinations uh, of sample points in an n-dimensional space. And um, you also need to consider that you don't do too much. So depending on some, some uh, maximum uh, number of samples you might want to consider. And also um, I did the uh, um, parallelization with the help of Joblib, which is also included inside uh, scikit-learn. So scikit-learn also comes with uh, some external packages which are directly included, like SIX and uh, Joblib. Okay, and then in this green tile SEN algorithm part, I calculate then the coefficients. Of course, the, the source code is online, so you can uh, check it out. And um, now um, the coefficients, they need to be... Um, they, they need to be stored, uh, stored for the predict function to work, and we store it in self-intercept and self-coef, um, um, so that the predict method that uses those arrays works. And in the end, of course, we return self, which allows us to chain different methods together that we can call fit and directly dot predict, for instance. So. After having um, programmed this, um, I was really happy that it worked so well. So without being a scikit-learn developer or something, I could really easily um, take my tile send prototype and put it in, inside this framework so that it can be used with, with things like uh, cross-validation, for instance, and so on. And um, I thought, okay, why not just um, give this back to uh, scikit-learn? So I got the okay from my boss and decided, okay, what do I now need to do to really um, contribute this? And again, so contributing in scikit-learn is also well documented, so they have really good uh, high quality standards. And um, so what you need to do if you um, also want to contribute something, you, your code, of course, should be unit tested at least 90%, better, of course, 100%. Um, to make really sure your method works. Then, um, of course, documentation is really important. So I think, looking back, um, the documentation uh, took me way longer than the actually writing the code because you need to find good examples, you need to explain a little bit your method, you need to define all your parameters in, in strings and so on. And, um, yeah, so... You should also consider what the complexity um, of your algorithm is, the spatial and uh, runtime complexity. And yeah, as I said before, like you need to draw some figures. Maybe you want to compare your method to an already implemented method in scikit-learn. And if you got um, the idea of this method from some paper, you should, of co course, make a reference to this paper or papers. Then there are, of course, coding guidelines. So, as usual, PEP8 and PyFlakes is used um, in scikit-learn. And they really help a lot to find, um, like, yeah, quite obvious problems. But um, it's good that it can be automatically checked. And as I said before, you should, uh, you should make sure that you lose, use the scikit-learn utils, that you don't re-implement stuff that is already there. And um, another big, uh, big barrier for me was that um, I had to um, yeah, make sure that my code runs in Python 2.6, 2.7, 3.4, and, so, uh, and so forth. And this can be done with the help of uh, 6 that you usually heard of. And this is also included in scikit-learn and the parallelization with the help of Choplib. Okay, so... This is about the requirements for contribution. And then I thought, okay, why not just uh, contribute this then? So a little bit about my experiences. Um, 
So my first pull request uh, started on March 8th. And uh, yeah, it was my first kind of pull request in, uh, in, uh, in the open source world. And uh, the community of uh, scikit-learn is really great. So um, there were a lot of improvements due to really good remarks. So I, um, I could improve the, or with the help of um, the, the scikit-learn main maintainers, the performance was increased by a factor of five or 10 even. So it was a really huge improvement. Um, and also I got some coding guidelines uh, still, I uh, had still wrong at this time. So this is really good. So of course, showing your code to other people always gets you good feedback. And um, then um, there was also discussion about uh, TileSend being more uh, statistical um, regressor and not really machine learning and so on, if it should maybe be better included in stats model. And if RANSEC, so this is the random sampling consensus um, method, is maybe almost uh, always better than, than TileSend, and this is something that is included in 0.15, and at this time uh, it was a scikit-learn 0.14, so it was not included at that time, so I didn't even know about this existed. So, um, so during that time I learned about the new methods, so um, yeah, it was really, really cool. And if you, yeah, want to follow up on this pull request, so it's currently, it's, so uh, so TileSend is still not included, so I'm um, still working on this. And uh, if you want to uh, learn about um, the discussion, it was a really interesting discussion, and I can only recommend to everyone, if you want to, um, if you want to contribute to an open source project, it's always a good idea because during that, um, yeah, during that mm -hmm. way, you really learn a lot just about uh, yeah, how to improve things and what common standards are and so on. Okay, so that's about it with my talk. Um, yeah, a little marketing slide. Blue Yonder, the company I work for, is hiring. Maybe you've seen us just outside um, at our booth and we will be here until uh, Sunday, so even throughout the Pi data. So if you wanna come and talk to us. Whoa, okay. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks, Are there any questions? <laughs> yep. I'm just wondering how does this technique compare to more traditional, robust techniques like rich regression or something? So the question was a little uh, tra more traditional, if there are more traditional techniques like what? Like rich regression? Rich regression. Yes. Yeah, rich regression is included, um, but yeah, it really depends. I mean, rich, what rich regression does is it removes features completely if you have too many features. It's techniques like lasso is another one and rich, and um, there the problem is more, you wanna avoid overfitting with those methods. So you have, let's say, uh, 100 features, but only 1,000 samples, and this is really, prone to overfitting, and then you give it to Lasso or Rich, or another one is ARD, and then it kind of says, um, okay, I throw out feature number five, and it reduces, it's more like a model redu a re a reduction thing. So, yeah, so the, the, the thing with the outliers is more, it's different, because you can have these outliers inside one features. And um, so I think it's a good idea to also include um, more robust estimators in scikit-learn. And as of now, I mean, RANSEC is now included, and this is an algorithm coming more from the computer vision. So it's a more heuristic, it's, it's not that complicated. It tries to select the right points and checks if it adds other samples to this consensus set and so on. So I think um, the scikit-learn uh, developers are really now looking for more robust things in addition to what they already have. Some more questions? Yeah, so the question was uh, if uh, TileSend could be paralyzed, and um, yeah, it can, and uh, I paralyzed it. So the thing is that taking out those, um, 
different combinations of all possible points. Of course, this can be done perfectly in parallel, and calculating then the hyperplanes can be done in parallel, and uh, writing back to some large arrow array is, can be done in parallel. So this is uh, what I did with the help of Choplib, which is included in Scikit-Learn, and this works really good. Only the last step that you need to find this one single spatial media, median. Um, so this is then, um, so the algorithm is based on a, a reweighted least square. I think it's called modified Weizfeld uh, method. And this um, is then iterative and can't be parallelized. But the first part, of course, is easily parallelized, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.